Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And today we are just going to have a discussion because after the last two weeks, we <laughs> we needed a, something lighter. And uh, so we're going to be talking about God in time. We're going to be talking about uh, one of the views that generally holds to kind of the conclusion we came to in our, our own study. And um, I'm just looking at the Bible because that's one thing we... We were not able to squeeze into that two hour talk is what what are a lot of ways scripture seems to support the idea that God changes God learns god God is disappointed he's excited you know it, all these different things that describe someone who is, seems to be authentically interacting with creation as opposed to knowing all things in the future, in which case why would he be disappointed if he knows it's going to happen right you know, things like that from last week someone said uh you know, you you guys kind of went with the philosophical approach versus like the biblical approach. And what I mentioned to that person when they asked us that question is that it's kind of like um, for the listeners that we have who who listen to to Leighton Flowers on Sociology 101 and, and Trinity Radio uh, with Jonathan Pritchett and Braxton Hunter. Uh, Jonathan said during the debate with uh, that he was with Leighton Flowers on that uh, when you read the Bible, it pre I think how he says it, it presupposes free will. Is that something to what? How kind of how Jonathan kind of said it? Yeah, yeah. All, all the all the places where the Bible talks about uh, having a having a choice, God mm-hmm. gives you choice of life. It just supposes, yeah, people can choose, and that's an authentic thing that we have. So sure. yeah, and so Jonathan said that, and, and I think um, I said the same thing in regards to um, this idea of God changing, of Him not knowing absolutely every you know certain instance in the future, you know. E- EDF that we mentioned in the past couple of episodes, um, that that that's the way the Bible's written. And uh, what's interesting is um, on a Google Hangout recently with Layton Flowers, the other part of that debate, the other half of that debate, well, on the good side, um, <laughs> said said to someone there that yeah, you have open theists actually have that on their side is that that's the way the Bible's written. Whether whether it's anthropomorphic or reality or whatever, it's that's still the way it's written. You know, that's the foundation of, of how we read the Bible. Yep. And I'm going to ask you some questions about that as we get into this. Um, what, and, and try to poke holes in it because it wasn't long ago that I was, you know, team EDF, as I believe you were, God has exhaustive or eternal definite foreknowledge of, you know, everything. So I want to, I want to throw out objections that I would have given at the time as we go and see which, which we prefer. Well, I know which one we'll prefer, <laughs> but which explanation seems to work better with scripture, uh, what we have now or what we had then. Right. And and something else um, that I think kind of goes with that is that we don't necessarily have all the answers to this. This is a kind of a, a big co- subject. Like like we mentioned in part one of, uh, of God in Time, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of this philosophical, logical, biblical, um, scientific, all that stuff. And all of this is, is a big, big pill to swallow and, and et cetera. And some people just don't care, as Dr. Pritchett said just in a Marco Polo earlier today. It's just something I don't care about, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there may be a time where, you know, some people at, at times don't care about uh, studying prophecy. And some people think that it's a huge thing. Uh, it's just we all go through seasons. And um, this is something that we've kind of been wrapping our minds up for a season. And, and uh, we still are just trying to put in some other little feathers here and there to, to finish it up. Yep. So, Billy, where where do you want to start? Well, before we get into a lot of these these scriptures, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, and that's anthropomorphic language, because that's oh, that was the thing I was going to ask. I know. You stole it. <laughs> what a jerk. You foreknew uh, my question. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, it's it's interesting how I how I can do that. Is that an answer for the entirety of scripture? Because there's hundreds of verses that we would have to say are anthropomorphic language so let, let's 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 back up real quick uh when you say anthropomorphic you, what you're saying is like uh, let's just use isaiah 5 and in isaiah 5 god says i have planted you israel as a choice vineyard i've pruned everything i've tilled the land you know it's perfect it's perfect and he's surprised that they didn't make produce good fruit as in they weren't faithful um this this is something that he seems to genuinely be surprised about why would you not do everything that i've asked you to do because i've provided literally everything for you to do it um and so what you're saying anthropomorphic or man language but what you're saying is uh one objection that i think the most common objection like you said 
would be, well, he, the writer is just using language that the audience would understand. So uh, the, the author there, Isaiah, is just saying, um, you know, so that it, God is relatable to you. Yeah, he was surprised. Uh, and then what we would uh, assume is, but he wasn't actually surprised because he knows all future things and he saw this coming. Um, but, but he's just trying to relate it to you, dumb people, <laughs> right? More or less. Right. Uh, anthropomorphic ascribing human form or attributes to a being or thing that's not human, especially to a deity. Um, so oftentimes, you know, God reached out his hand. Well, God is a spirit, so he doesn't have a hand. That's, that's anthropomorphic, right? In a, in a True, real yep. easy sense um attributes trying to say uh, i don't know i guess that would be expectation i don't know if that's an attribute or i guess um god is love so that's so since we can love are we is there is there a god 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 godopomorphic are we godopomorphic <laughs> the, since, theopomorphic? We, since we can love like god is love that I mean that's his attribute and we're we're using it so is that God? We're, God, we're imaging, right? <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> so I, I don't understand that. To me, it, it adds a whole lot of confusion, and it seems that God isn't the author of confusion. I know I've read that somewhere, probably in some philosophical book. Yeah, <laughs> you made that up, probably. <laughs> right. Um, it seems very, very strange um, that he would try to make things relatable, but then it would just confuse us, so it'd make it more unrelatable. Where if he just said, "I know." That if I would strike you with a plague, that it's still not going to make you change your mind. And what's interesting is there are situations, uh, particularly in the New Testament, uh, I'm thinking of, where Jesus tells the story of the rich man and the uh, and Lazarus, and uh, he in a situation where the, the rich man says, "Hey, send someone to preach to my brothers." And and Moses, uh, is it, no, Abraham is there, and mm-hmm. he says, "Even if someone comes back from the dead, your brothers aren't going to believe if they're not believing Moses." And so it, it, that's a situation where uh, scripture's not scared of just pointing out the fact that you're not going to uh, like, I know the outcome of this situation and it's not going to work out for you. If God knew in Isaiah five, that they certainly were not going to be faithful. Like he expected them to be, right. I, why, why would he hide that? Why wouldn't he just say, I did all this because I'm faithful to my word, but I knew you wouldn't be faithful to yours. And I wanted to demonstrate that. Why, why go through the whole storytelling? <clears throat> just, why wouldn't you be straight with us about it? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, there's a passage in Isaiah. I, uh, if I could had time, I could look it up. But it's it's God pointing after like plague and uh, storm and and as judgment against Israel to try to get them to repent over and over and over again. But they didn't. Why? What's the point? If if he already knows that they're not going to, what's the point of doing that? When, like you just pointed out, Matt, that he does say, "Why would I do that when I know it's not going to have any effect?" You know why? It yeah. doesn't make it's doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make it very confusing. It, it, and, and it goes back to what we talked about at the end of the last episode. Uh, it's a matter of uh, simplicity and, and the least amount of assumptions. Um, it, does it make sense to assume that that God knows the future and is just going through the motions, and we're going to read that into all these situations, or does it make sense to assume that? it's what he, it sounds like he is saying he is actually disappointed. He is actually surprised. Uh, he is actually searching the hearts of people and understanding, you know, who they are and what they're, they're hardening themselves one way or another. Um, should we just take it at face value or should we have this overarching thing? We have to apply to all these situations and assume that they're just being, you know, uh, anthropomorphic. Right. And, and kind of going back to the same kind of thing, um, is, is, God patient, or is that just an attribute, a human attribute that we put on him? Yeah. And how can a timeless, all-knowing being be patient? <laughs> I mean, what's he be? Yeah, uh, patient. Patient with his... Patient implies waiting, right? Right. And a timeless being doesn't have to wait because all things are present before them, so weird. Hmm. Let's give him some biblical examples. Before we get into so, uh, one other thing, so okay. this also kind of goes with, I was thinking about this right before we started, with angels, right? So we have our understanding, and then we have to look at these beings who were with God, you know, who sang at, at the creation um, and sounded for, uh, shouted for joy, and who knew God and then, you know, chose to rebel against him. And I would, I, I think I, I think I can make the assumption that they would know 
more about God than we would. You know what I mean? Like they would understand. Uh, they, they would know more word. about like God's attributes and His power and, and all that stuff that than we would because they've actually seen like behind the scenes, like it actually in like they saw God create everything, <laughs> right? They've seen certainly, yeah, yeah. The right? what was that Job? The sons of God shouted for joy right. as they placed the pillars of the earth. Right, and yeah, they have a very different view. It, it, it seems um, psychotic if the angels understand God to have eternal, definite foreknowledge, um, that they would attempt any sort of rebellion, that Satan would still be going around trying to seek seek people he can devour, just that he he's going to have an, a war. It just it just it's mind boggling to me. It's interesting. I'm reading it right now. Um, Michael Heiser just released a book on angels. Very interesting. I'm, I don't know, probably a quarter of the way through it. And he talks about the counsel of God and just that some of the things that are ascribed to these people, uh, these people, these beings in scripture. And uh, they, they do, they keep track of like, some of them are given kind of geographical areas to keep track of. Michael is called the Prince of, of Israel. Mm-hmm. Seemed to indicate that he, he was their angel. Uh, or whatever the right word is. Um, and uh, they, they were given the task of keeping track of things. And like, if, if, if I, it doesn't make any sense to me, like you said, if God has absolute definite foreknowledge, then, you know, what, what, what's there to, what's there to keep track of? What's the, what, what are we learning here? What, what's the difference? I mean, not that he doesn't know all these things without the, without the help of the angels, but still it's, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so like we mentioned um, in the last episode, we said God is like the source of time. And we we kind of saw that where in the beginning God created the universe. And then he is the one that establishes how time works, right? And in the entire universe, that the entire man-made understanding of the universe, um, I don't know how to say that, but people with brains <laughs> use the sun and the earth to establish days. And the reason we do that is because God established that in the beginning. And as soon as that happened, to me, it seems that God now uses and does things in a timetable, right? We have seven days. He talks about, you know, I'm going to give Israel 40 years. He does all these things. He is in and uses time since he's established it at the beginning. Well, uh, he's not in it, right? That would make it a higher standard. But, yeah, he he certainly... Uh, I'm saying that he can be measured sequential. by these events, right? When he he we could measure six thousand years back, or however long it's been <laughs> since <laughs> since God started, um, since Adam and Eve been in the garden, we can measure that period of time. And God is here, so we could measure that event from God then and God now. You know what I mean? That's what I mean by "quote unquote" in time. Yeah, yeah. According to our scale right. what, what he experiences how he experiences it could be very different right it's probably certainly is very different than us but yeah no i know what you're right um yeah it, it, he we can uh kind of quantify his interaction with creation mm-hmm. in a way all right so one of the scriptures that kind of i think of often with this idea of um eternal definite foreknowledge and and time and and all that stuff is the the passages relating to testing like Genesis twenty two twelve, 12, um, he said, this is God, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now, I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from you. So that is Abraham takes Isaac up on the, uh, up on the Mount and is about to kill him. And, uh, God stops him. Right. That's where, you know, don't lay a hand on. Him. Um, and let's see if, let me give the, what I would have said like a month ago. Um, so this was God, if he, he, God knew that Abraham was, was going to be faithful, then really this was God, uh, basically make, having Abraham go through the motions so that Abraham had this experience of being faithful before God. Uh, not that God was having to learn about this in any way. So the test was more for like Abraham than it was for God. Right. That would have been my answer then. Right. <clears throat> and if you you can take the role of, of yourself a couple months ago, um, when when God says, for now I know that you fear God, was that a lie? 
it was it was <laughs> this is where I'd have to be like, yeah, you know, I mean, he's saying it from for the for the for Abraham's sake, not that like God uh, all of a sudden discovered this this news, but he he just wanted Abraham to see, oh, okay, my my actions have. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that that situation because it sounds so so much like jumping back to current me. Uh, it sounds so much like God is saying, uh, "I did this test to see if you were faithful. I now see that you are faithful." Like it just it, he learned like right. you and I would learn. Like right. Yeah. That I mean, it seems like just from the basic reading that God now knows the level of Abraham's faith. Yeah. And yeah, it's he, actually he, after this time. that God establishes a new covenant with Abraham. So it seems kind of important. And then we also have, so it, it's not just with Abraham, um, we have uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, we talked about where it, God is talking to the Israelites about when they were in the wilderness. He says, Deuteronomy 8, 2 says, you should remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness for these 40 years, that he, he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And 8.16, in the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. And obviously there's a lot of passages in the New Testament about testing and tribulations and trials, etc. Yeah, yeah, the, all, all the conditional statement. I would just, um, what did I just watch? Oh, uh, Braxton and Jonathan over at uh, Trinity Primetime Radio uh, watched their latest episode on YouTube because Braxton was gallivanting across Turkey recently and he visited the seven churches of Revelation and they talk about it and it's good stuff and if you think about the the message that Jesus had to these different churches he would tell them look the, these are these are the good stuff that you got going on these are the bad things you got going on um, here's the prize you can get crown of life this new name this clean robe all this stuff uh if you persevere to the end, if you don't, then you won't get it. And like, wouldn't he know <laughs> already if he had definite foreknowledge, like what, why are there conditionals here? Like he, again, you'd have to just assume he's doing it for the sake of the reader, not that he's actually learning anything or that he doesn't know for sure what's going to happen. Right. You know, it, it's, it'd be so easy if that he might humble you, um, testing you. So you know what's in your heart. <laughs> Right, <laughs> you know, just, yeah. just, just, you're so <laughs> right. Yeah, not to, not for him to know, but so you know what's in your heart. It, yeah, it it, uh, it made it so much clearer. You when you when you said uh, Braxton was gallivanting in, in Turkey, um, I had an image of Braxton and uh, Monty Python and Search for Holy Grail, where Braxton was like gallivanting with like somebody behind him going. Had to, had a couple coconuts uh-huh. clicking them together. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that would have been great. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, all of these conditional statements that they, they seem to be pretty clearly indicating uh, that God is interacting. It, it, let's uh, let me back up. It sounds more authentic. It it rings more true to say that God doesn't know the outcome of these things when He is testing, when He is searching. Um, when He does that, He's doing it for a reason, so that He knows that person and what they're willing to do versus how you'd have to explain it, which is he already knows he's just doing it for them. (laughs) Like, "Mm, then why not just say that? Mm -hmm. You know? Right. I mean, Billy, if scripture actually just came out and said, God knew what Abraham was going to do, but he did it. He put Abraham through this test so that Abraham knew how far he was actually willing to go for God. Would you have any problem just saying, okay, well then that says that about God and I accept it. No. Because we have all, you know, all of us with fathers, um, and ch- or all of, oh, all of us with fathers, we all have fathers, <laughs> all of us with kids, <laughs> you know, do things right for our kids to teach them things. But we tell them, you know, I did that to teach you something, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. We don't say, now I know. We say, I did this so you learn not to touch that. You learn that it's hot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Hey. I'm going to see if you'll touch this so that I'll learn <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Good example. And I just tried to, um, just authenticity. That's a big part of it. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, here's one. So, uh, we've talked about, we, well, in our episode on immutability, the immutability, um, does God change? If so, how does he change? And we explained God's nature and God's character doesn't change, but, uh, within his established set of rules, he does interact, right? So uh, Jeremiah 18 has been a, a go-to for us. 
um, this is where God is saying that if a kingdom will, well, I'll read a portion of it. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed. And if that nation I warned repents of its evil, <clears throat> then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Uh, and if at another time I announce that, uh, so anyway, you get the point. Uh, take Nineveh, for instance, Nineveh was going to get destroyed. God sent uh, Jonah to let them know. And if they repented, God would relent. And what, what did they do after God had to kick Jonah in the butt? Uh, he went to Nineveh. He let them know they repented and God relented that, that, I mean, it, it was a, it was an end time interaction. Had, had Jonah not gone or had the people not repented, we know that God would have, uh, destroyed them. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let me jump back into my two months ago brain. Um, I, I could possibly say it's kind of like a, a, a computer program, right? God established a, uh, a set of parameters and anytime someone violated, you know, uh, this, this, um, faithfulness code here, then they would receive these punishments. And if they relented, then they are the, the system, so to speak, uh, reacts appropriately. And so he could foreknow, uh, it's not that he's changing. It's just that these people are going in and out of these different states of um, it, being in the right standing with God versus rebelling against him. And uh, if they continue in one of them long enough, something will happen. Um, so, you know, maybe God's not changing or it, that maybe that still allows for God to have definite foreknowledge of what they're going to do. But he is just um, letting them go through the motions until they reach the point where uh, they have persisted long enough to be punished or whatever. Does that make any sense? So if, if, uh, if God is, if that was us a couple months ago, right. Kind of God has established this, this algorithm that measures kingdoms. And what, what would you say now? And, in, in For, yeah. first of all, when I see that, I, when we start thinking, uh, putting everything is kind of like set to certain things with certain parameters, all that yeah. seems to me make, make is God is an impersonal program where he only acts with X's or ones and zeros, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's that's not the God of Scripture that I see. Um, he he does. I mean, we're going to talk about this, but prayer and pleading and intercession and you know Moses pleading for the Israelites. You know, I'm not going to lead you. Uh, I'm, I might destroy you. We have an intercession. And then we have God changing his mind and actually leading the people. Um, we have Abraham uh, discussing and and debating over Sodom, we have a God that isn't X's and O's. And we see this over and over again uh, throughout the scripture uh, of God actually having an interpersonal relationship and a, and a real dialogue with real, you know, possibility to... Uh, we can't put God in a box of like, he's always going to act this way, he's always going to act this way. You know what I mean? That that <laughs> There seems to be um, room for God to make multiple decisions that that can still all be the same a, a decision that's good you know what I mean it, or, uh, the thing that popped in my mind when you were talking about that um, especially talking about an intercessor is uh, when we talked about Romans 9 and um, let me see if I can get the verses right I think it's like 14 through 16 or 13 through 16 it's when we, we went back to Exodus and we explained look when God says he's going to have mercy on whom he'll have mercy and he'll harden whom he's going to harden um, the mercy part He's talking to Moses, and Moses, uh, apart from Israel, is interceding between God and Israel. And God's saying, I'm about to go down there. I'm going to jack them all up. And Moses is like, whoa, hold on a second. Uh, you brought them out for a reason. You want the whole world to be glorified. Uh, why don't we do that plan? And God says, okay, since you, you know, uh, I'm going to stick to the plan. Um, and, and that was a shadow of Christ interceding for us and saying, okay, don't, let's not destroy all of them. Uh, how about you know, anybody that's in me? We save. And uh, so it, it's, it seems pretty clear that God has an intended thing he's going to do, but then he allows someone to intercede in a personal way for a group of people. And then God relents because of that intercession. Um, this, why? Well, go ahead. This go fits ahead. perfect with a parable that I was going to talk about later that I'll bring about now. Luke okay. chapter 13. This is Jesus speaking. And he says, And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it, and it did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. 
Why does it even use up the ground? And he, the vineyard keeper, uh, answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer, and if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. Who is this parable about? Uh, is it about the believer and bearing fruit and, you know, kind of like John 15? Mm-hmm. So, right, so who is the who is the man in the fig tree? The man is God the Father. The vineyard keeper is Christ. Right, right, right. Yeah, those who are under Christ. Hey, Christ is our shepherd in mm-hmm. John 10. Or John, yeah, 10. Um, so, yeah, anybody who is under Christ's headship, uh, again, John 15, if you're in the vine, but you don't produce fruit, then the Father is going to cut you down right. and put you in fire. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right, and, he, and it's, it's the it's the man who's going to cut it down, but it's the intercessor, the vineyard keeper, who says, you know, he's he intercesses, he at, he's the advocate, right? So we had I mean, here we have the father who's saying, cut it down, and we have the son interceding, changing the father's mind. That doesn't make any sense if it's all eternal, definite foreknowledge. Why would these yeah, two? It, why would why the father and the son do this? You know what I mean? No, definitely. And and that goes back to what we talked about at the end of the last episode. Um, if God knows for certain that someone is going to be born, maybe uh, joins the church, maybe lives in, as a part of the king, as a part of the family of God for 40 years and then decides to apostatize and re- rejects God. If God knows that that person is going to eventually reject him, why does God allow that person to be born just to add another person to the fire mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, no, instead he he allows – he doesn't have that definite knowledge and he genuinely uh, wants everybody to repent. And he even allows for these intercessory kind of uh, instances where whether it's Moses or Jesus or you know anybody who is uh, – even uh, Job. We talked about him recently uh, today I think in a Marco Polo or something. Um, mm-hmm. The three friends were were not in a good place before God. And God could have justly, you know, punished them for that, but he he allowed Job to intercede on their behalf uh, because Job was righteous. So you have all these things that, that they're not authentic if God already knows what's going to happen. I mean, or why not just go ahead and not have those people in the first place because you know they're going to reject you, right? And yeah, that that points to a lot of different things like eternal security and and well, <laughs> or not eternal. It's just. Yeah, it's uh, strange. They were never saved. Oh, there's a big one. Okay. Um, so e- eternal security. And I actually saw this in a Facebook group. I won't name it, but uh, Billy knows what I'm talking about, <laughs> which group it is. Um, the There are regularly little like mini wars over whether or not once saved, always saved is a thing, mm-hmm. eternal security. And if Billy and I participate at all, it's only for a couple comments and then like share our link to our <laughs> episodes. And uh we do have a big study out there. It's over like 5,000 words. Um, and we do have two or three episodes on right. what saved, always saved. Is it true? Is it not? And inevitably, the the, the traditional view that kind of holds to, yes, once you're a believer, there is no way to apostatize. You, you are locked in. You're saved forever. And And we would say, well, what about the people who do leave? And they would say, well, they were never saved. Okay. Um, that's assuming... <laughs> that a kind of uh, definite foreknowledge view where God knows mm-hmm. the people who are exactly. actually going to persist. And so, okay, the ones who do make it to the end, they were really saved, but God, but he knows the ones who are going to apostatize. And so while they were faithful, while they were in the vine, they weren't quote unquote, really saved. That's that. <laughs> no, what we're told is when they're in the vine, when they're in Christ, they are saved. They are credited with all with righteousness and all the stuff. They are children of God, and then they cut themselves. They allow them. They they strangle their faith, and they are cut off from the, those blessings. Um, so they were saved, and then they were not. And this this God has to have. Or God definitely has foreknowledge, so they couldn't have been saved. That's just not biblical. Sorry. Yeah, um, I I got <laughs> into a little discussion with uh with someone about this and this kind of points to what matt's saying like scripture is written in a in a in a presentism kind of a a now view right what what is what your what your belief is what your faith is now that's that's how god looks at you um but if if tomorrow you don't have faith or you 
you know, that kind of thing, then that's now how God looks at you. You know, it's how you are now, right now. He who's believing in the Lord is the one that is saved. Not he who once believed in the Lord, you know, is saved. And I mentioned uh, John, you know, John 15 obviously goes to that one. If you're presently abiding in the vine, then you, you know, are 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 righteous. You're with, with, you're with the Lord. But if you stop mm-hmm. abiding, if you stop producing the fruit, then you will be cut off. There's, there's, that's, that's how it's written. Uh, Ezekiel mentions, again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, right? So here we go. We have a righteous man turning away from his righteousness. Well, how does he do yeah. that? How can a righteous man, one who, and we know that righteousness only comes by faith through the work of Christ. So, if this person has faith, if he turns away from his righteousness, then there's there's been a a, a, trans- a, a difference in th- this person. You know what I mean? He was righteous, and now he's not. It wasn't, well, he never was righteous. No, according to Scripture, he was righteous, and he turned away from his righteousness. Now, we believe that that person will not be rewarded for their righteousness. If they reject God right, in that's the end, they're said. not going to be rewarded. Yeah, it turns... Right. Uh, it says, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to the, all the abominations that a wicked man does, he will, will he live? All his righteous deeds, which he has done, will not be remembered for his treachery, which he has committed. That's just yeah, like, like the third vine, that he bears no fruit to maturity. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he it, was it, it, righteous, according to this, <laughs> right? Or there'd be no reason to tell that story in the first place. Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Right. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, I... I Let's try to move on to some more scripture. Sure. Um, Exodus 13, 7. uh, Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see the war and return to Egypt. Now how easy and how simple would it have been? The people would would change their minds. (laughs) It would have been so much easier. But it's actually in that that, um, the possibility you know, tense. Is it subjunctive, right? Or? It's not. Yeah. It's not a definite kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, why? Why go through the motions if he has perfect foreknowledge? Right. Hmm. So prayer. Yeah, I had that one on my list to ask you about right. too. Second Samuel twelve twenty one to twenty three. Um, this is speaking about David. Then his servant said to him, David, what is this thing you have done? While a child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. So this is after David had um, committed adultery and murder, um, and uh, Bathsheba was pregnant, and and David is praying about for the basically the, the, the baby's safety and health. Uh, and David said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now that he's died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? So it, it, it appears that we are at least in the same boat as David, that the Lord, prayer works, that the Lord actually... There's not some eternal definite thing going on. It's it's not either he's gonna live or he's not gonna live. You know, you you can actually intercede and and expect God to answer prayer. Yeah, and I can't remember the citation off the top of my head, but Jesus at one point says, Anything you ask in my name I think he's talking to the disciples specifically, the mm-hmm. twelve. But anything you ask in my name, it will be it will be given to you. The Father's, you know, listening. The, the obvious implication there is they could need something and not ask for it and not get it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if God knows for certain, like, the, the the needs that these people have, why wouldn't he just provide it right on time every time versus why why are we told to pray? Why are we told to ask and, and to – to uh, why does the Holy Spirit in groans that we can't understand communicate to the Father – <laughs> things like what why would he need to intercede for us at all on a day-to-day basis for our needs if god already eternally knows them it's it, pr- prayer is a big one for this i mean i i think as much as uh the question of why does god allow a, a baby to be born if he knows they're going to rebel why pray if uh, are we just supposed to be going through the motions but god already knows and it's like uh you know uh, I know my kid wants ice cream, but I'm not going to give them ice cream until they ask me for it. Like, <laughs> um, it's weird. Mm-hmm. The the presentist view makes way more sense. Uh, with David, he is expecting, or he knows that God could do this, and he is going to appeal to him as if he would. Um, 
I don't, I, I don't know. That's that's a a big one for me. Mm-hmm. We already talked about Isaiah five about the vineyard and the vine, and you know God expected sure. it to produce righteousness, but it didn't. Um, I don't see how he could have expectations. And, he, and there's another one that's kind of similar. Uh, Jeremiah thirty six. Um, Take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. Perhaps, this is God speaking, the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way. Then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. They didn't, by the way. Um, (laughs) Spoiler warning. Right. Perhaps, perhaps the house of Judah will hear the calamity. So this is a... A, this is on renew.org and I'm just reading some verses here. Um, and, uh, uh, one thing that they point out about this view is the Lord sometimes asks non rhetorical questions about the future. Uh, numbers 14, 11, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? So this is God obviously talking about the Israelites who have witnessed all sorts of stuff. Um, why, why are they still being jerks and not trusting the Lord? Um, why would a uh, God who knows all future things bother to ask one dude this question? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it, it's, it, it may be because he doesn't necessarily know all future things. And again, if that's freaking you out that we're, we're suggesting that keep in mind that idea is not biblical. That is something that is brought in from Greek philosophy that is, uh, kind of demands, well, God, any God must be like this. Um, but what we explained in our last two episodes is, uh, no, y- you can still read the Bible and you can still credit God with omniscience. You can still credit God with uh, all of the prophecy that he's done and and not violate any of that and, and still say that he does not know all future events. So I, I just throw that out there. If this is If you're listening to this and haven't listened to the last two, you might want to back up. Right. Jesus in Matthew twenty four twenty two says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Aha. So, Definite foreknowledge. Boom. It's a future thing. And Jesus knows that people are going to die and uh, that they're going to have to cut the time short or else all the <laughs> believers are going to die. And how could he know that unless um, he knows all future things? How 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 so, could he cut something shorter than it was never meant to be? What? <laughs> <laughs> how could he cut short time unless if if it was set to be this time? How could he cut it short? Oh, so like if he foreknew that he was going to cut it short, it's going to be a hundred years. Be but short? I'm going to cut it short. How could it be a hundred years in the first place? If he foreknew that he was going to cut it short, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, but it does, you know, so you do have to read that though and go, okay, well, he knows though that the situation is going to be bad. How does he know that? Mm-hmm. Well, he knew. Uh, keep, keep in mind uh, the the um, Christ, the, the resur- uh, not the resurrection. Well, yes, the resurrection, but the crucifixion as an example. God knew that that by his stripes were healed. He knew that the Messiah was going to be beat. He was going to be killed uh, and that we would be saved through that sacrifice. Um, When did he bring Jesus about in quote, the fullness of time? Mm, I was just going to pull that up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. When is, when, when are the end times quote unquote going to be in the fullness of time? We we don't know. (laughs) Uh, We're just supposed to watch. Isn't that talk about the fullness of the Gentiles? Yeah. Partial hardening said happen until Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Yeah. So when is that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't say. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a concrete, like, right. you know, when he said that, it's definitely going to be 3,000 years in the future. It could just be whenever that point is reached. Mm-hmm. Right. Some other ones. Any, any, any one that, like, stands out? Any one that you often get that you want to bring up? Um. Some some common ones uh, before the flood, God is regretting. So uh, the Lord said, this is Genesis 6, 5 and 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was evil uh, continuously. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings. Again, you have this idea. Why why would God regret something if he knew that it was going to end up this way? You know, um, 
didn't God know that Satan was going to fall? Didn't God know that Satan was going to go tempt Adam and Eve? Didn't God know that Adam and Eve were going to fall? Why would he allow these things to happen? It, I mean, if he knew all that for sure, and then he still created, you know, Satan, he allowed the serpent to go into the, the uh, garden and he still created man, then he must have wanted the fall. Ooh, yeah, that's, you know, you get into God's authoring evil there. Like, no, I mean, even, you know, even the free will folks who hold to definite foreknowledge, they're going to say, no, that was the free decision of man. He just allowed it to happen. Um, but you, you, the question still has to be asked if he knew it was going to happen and he decided to create anyway, then to some extent, it feels like he intended for it to happen. Um, but he had a contingency in place. He was going to redeem the world and then, you know. That is an answer, but how much more authentic does it feel? And and I know I'm using feel a lot, and it's not based <laughs> on our emotions. Again, go back to our last two episodes. But how more how much more authentic does his interaction with creation seem to be uh, if he didn't know for sure that Adam and Eve were going to fall, but he he placed that opportunity there for them as a way of being um, as a way of intimacy, as a way of uh, allowing for them to reject the relationship that he had with them because he wants authentic relationships. So, uh, yeah, another one. So he regrets all those things. He regrets that he made man. He, you know, the fall was not something he, uh, knew, although he left the opportunity there for Adam and Eve in case they did decide to rebel. Um, another one is when he established, uh, Oh, what's his face? Saul as King. So he warns the Israelites, look, Mm -hmm. you don't want a King. You don't want to be like all those other nations. And they were like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. We definitely want a king. And uh, so so through Samuel, God tells him, fine, pick yourself a king. And they're like, yo, the tall, handsome dude over there who speaks well. Let's get him. <laughs> and uh, God is like, okay, I anoint him king. And then later he's he regrets anointing Saul king because it turns out Saul was kind of stuck up and he, he sucked as a king. <laughs> and so, again, you have these things like if God knew that Saul was going to suck as a king, although, you know, the writing was on the wall on that one, uh, it, it – why allow that to happen? You know, um, it could be that he was allowing Israel to just suffer the consequences of making a bad decision in the first place. That's a possibility. I'm not the ruling that out. But again, if, if he knew it, why the regret he would have known, he could have just said, and I knew this was a bad idea. And I told him so like, like well, why describe him as regretting it? If he knew it was going to happen, you know, mm-hmm. Another conversation uh, we had recently on Marco Polo that kind of pertains to this idea of knowledge and and such <clears throat> um, is is wisdom. You, did you hear this conversation that I had about God's uh, wisdom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm going to let you explain it. Um, what? Well, let me ask you: what is what is wisdom, or what is godly wisdom? Uh, wisdom as opposed to just regular smarts knowledge mm-hmm. is, is how to apply that knowledge in an appropriate way. So you could be the smartest guy on earth, but if you are unwise, if you're foolish, then you're going to use your smarts to do something stupid as opposed to a wise person who is going to use their knowledge, uh, as a weapon kind of <laughs> as to, for, you know, greater good. Right. And so this kind of pertains to God's uh, eternal definite foreknowledge and, and, wisdom with the exhaustive or eternal definite foreknowledge what is the point of wisdom how does it even pertain to anything if what god knows he's always known and there's never been a time where he hasn't known it where did wisdom play a part in anything that he did uh so this this is where it gets a little hairy (laughs) (laughs) because then it becomes like a circular argument you know what i'm saying oh yeah for sure this is me two months ago um (laughs) (laughs) See, so yeah, God foreknows his own actions. So it will, and it, he, he, well, yeah, it's hard to talk about because you're right, it's circular. He, he's using his wisdom to make these choices, but he's eternally foreknown the choices he was going to make. So which came first, the, the choice or the foreknowledge? And then, and then, uh, is he free to choose otherwise? Like, if he eternally foreknew, these these wise things he was going to do was he ever able to not like take a different course of action you know right and uh, I don't, wisdom I don't know seems to be able to take information and data and and character and justice and all those things together 
and make a, a wise decision. But there is yeah. no decision if everything has always been known. Yeah, I agree. I, I, it makes I it, thought that was a great point you brought up. It seems to be a conundrum to me. I, maybe there's a way to understand it, but I don't know. <sighs> yeah, wisdom seems to be a playing out of knowledge, kind of. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, doesn't make any sense. Hey, let me ask you this, Billy, because uh, I don't think we talked about this in our, our time episode, but God, God's sovereignty. So we are, as, as hopefully all Christians are, concerned with making sure we think of God in the highest possible light. We want to make sure that when we talk about him being sovereign, we are you know, taking the, the, the highest road possible. Um, now, I could see some people saying, that if God doesn't know all future events, then we have some we have uh, decreased His sovereignty in a sense. We have uh, belittled Him in some way by taking this quality away. Um, how would you respond to that? How would you? Well, I don't think it would affect His sovereignty at all. I mean, we there's sovereign nations, there's sovereign kings, and they don't know everything, but yet it doesn't affect their their sovereignty, their kingship, their rulership, so to speak. Um, so I, I definitely don't see it related to sovereignty. Um, now, does it relate to power or um, omnipotence? Um, yeah, no, because <laughs> God's still um, all powerful. When and all powerful, you know, is <laughs> one of those words that you kind of have to define. What does all powerful mean? Well, it means that there's no one more powerful than he is. That's that's an easy way of explaining it. Um, yeah. And that's the case. He's all. There's no one more powerful than he is. So, whether or not he knows uh, certainty from a billion years from now, he's still all powerful. And if he wants something to happen in a billion years, he can make it happen. One of the examples that you and Leighton both use quite a bit is that of a chess player. If you have, if God is the greatest conceivable chess player, then um, is it more powerful for him to have a list of all the moves you're going to make and that's how he beats you consistently? Uh, or is it more powerful? Is it more um, awe-inspiring for him to not know the future, allow you to make any free decision you want, and still in real time whoop you every game <laughs> like, right which ones which one seems actually to be more impressive right I think the the one where it plays out in time and the same thing applies with with you know wrath you know if everyone actually knows the lord and has his word and understands that they can only you know call upon him and faith to be saved um and then they reject that they walk away from that they suppress that um is that more deserving of wrath than somebody who actually had no capability at all to know or do any of those things? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> all right. So I think we covered a lot of scripture. Um, there's, we could do this for hours and hours, just going through various passages about the Bible um, and pull different things out and look at it different ways. Um, but the, the point I think is that this kind of goes back to the whole duck and rabbit thing that Leighton has also used a lot, you know, that y you can read passages one way and then figure out how to read the ones that don't fit that um, in, a, in an anthropomorphic way or uh, just a weird way. Um, I think it's easier to read scripture at face value and the ones that might seem to, to express... EDF, for example, in which I think are, are kind of rare, actually, compared to the other ones. Um, it's Very. easier to explain those through the same way that we would know things. Like, again, in, in the past, like, the three episodes that we had on time, I've mentioned multiple things that you were going to do <laughs> before you did them. Um, just because of wisdom and knowledge and knowing you, I knew that mm -hmm. you were going to say something. And, and, again, take that to, the, to, to a, an exponential level that we can't comprehend with God. And it's easy to see how he can know things um, in the future. But yeah, yet it's also will... easy to see where he can expect things that don't happen in the future. Right. Um, I will say, so th th this episode is just as important as the last two. But there's for the reason Billy just explained, the duck and the rabbit, it, th that is why we did not start with scripture. Because anything that we read, a person who who is convinced of 
God's exhaustive or eternal definite foreknowledge could just apply that their understanding to any of the verses we have and say, well, yeah, I can make sense of that too. Any of them. And, and so we couldn't start there. We had to go the philosophical route because we had to kind of undercut, okay, is God changeless? No, the incarnation. Um, can, uh, does, is time something outside of God that can apply to him or is it arbitrary? You know, is it a higher standard or is it arbitrarily made? No, it's like Euthyphro's dilemma. It actually stems from God. It's not something outside of him. That's you know, everything is contingent. Like a pendulum. Him. Yeah. Like a pendulum. <laughs> and John can do his, <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, and, and is, is, is it, does it make uh, logical sense for God to have a, definite foreknowledge of an actual infinite well technically no um it doesn't and that it's not you know any any uh we're not trying to belittle god it's just that it it doesn't make logical sense and logical impossibilities we've consistently ruled out of his power Uh, he doesn't make married bachelors his knowledge he doesn't know what a square triangle is Mm -hmm. i mean a four-sided triangle is you know we've we've consistently ruled those out so it's not like we're just throwing on this extra thing an actual infinite is a logical impossibility so he just doesn't have it i mean that's that's not a hit against him um and we had to get those in place so that when you do come to scripture with us in this episode and you see Hmm. Okay. I see what yeah, I hear what they're saying. And I, I, I kind of need to grapple with the logical, you know, uh, arguments that they already made. We just think this makes more sense. It seems more biblical, uh, logically speaking, uh, just at face value. And when we say face value, we're not like hyper literalists <laughs> in scripture, you know, take things from scripture and the genre and, and according to the, the way that it's written, um, you know, all of that. But when we say take it at face value, we mean, you know, when God says he would regret something, it's because he has authentic regret. It's not, he's not putting on a show. So that was the motivation for saving this for the, the last part here. Um, what's the, we'll do one last verse. <clears throat> um, we already talked about how David obviously expected get God could change and do things. Um, God didn't have eternal definite foreknowledge or exhaustive definite foreknowledge. Uh, what does Peter say about election? Uh, making your calling. Oh, that's right. What is that? First Peter one or second Peter one, make sure your calling and election as in, he says, uh, practice these things. And he goes mm-hmm. through a list of a bunch of stuff, man. It's been so long since I've looked at that passage. I forgot <laughs> it. That's terrible. It used to be a, a uh, common one, wasn't it? <laughs> I know we used it a lot. Uh, that's, it's happening more and more people that the farther we go along, we're forgetting the things that we depended on at one point. Um, yeah, no, Peter says, uh, I, practice these things, patience, brotherly love, kindness, you know, all, on and on. Um, and in this way, you ensure you're calling an election. Yeah, that's a uh, – so what, where are you going with that? Well, how, how, how can elect, which is a you know predestined choice, be more sure than it was in eternity past? Well, Peter evidently proponents didn't of, think e- about that. Proponents of EDF would say uh, it was certain to God – where that person would end up, but in time, that person was making it sure for themselves. Yeah, it's it's another one. It's just like just like Abraham. I'm not. Ch- I'm you know. It's it, work it's out not- your your salvation with fear and trembling. Not not for my sake. I know what's going on, mm-hmm. but uh, for you, you need to know. And uh, we'll, I'm I'm waiting at the end at the finish line for you. Mm-hmm. Run the race. Yeah, he's got the the cold cup of water at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. I think that's pretty good for now. I'm sure we'll, we'll so. have a follow up. Yeah, so that that's one thing I want y'all to. Billy kind of threw a, a challenge out there. I don't know if you heard it or not, but he said, and I agree, that verses that explicitly support God's exhaustive definite foreknowledge, eternal definite foreknowledge, uh, are few and far between. In fact, I can't actually think of one off the top of my head. So uh, that's that's a challenge for you if you know one. And we're not opposed to him being there. Uh, we'd love to hear it because maybe we need to adjust our view. Uh, but if you know one, email it to us, BibleBrowdown at gmail.com or throw it in the Facebook group. And if you're not a member, uh, go check it out. Join. We've got some great people. And um, also, while you're at it, I know we mentioned Jonathan and Braxton over at Trinity Primetime Radio. And we've mentioned Leighton Flowers at Soteriology 101. And uh, also go check out Steve Gregg at The Narrow Path, all members of the Trinity Commission. And... Uh, yeah. I think that's it, dude. Yep. God bless. God bless.